All right, guys. So in Mendelian genetics packet, a lot of this you should already know. Uh, for instance, here where it says uh, father determines the sex of the child, we've discussed this one already. Uh, where it says uh, each parent contributes half of the ge child's genetic makeup, you should already know the answer to that. Uh, where it says certain drug, al uh, drugs and alcohol can cause birth defects on the fetus, you should know whether that's true or false. Stuff like that, uh, you already know the answers to, but we'll see. This is your pre this is your pre quiz, uh, so I just want you to answer these honestly, and so you won't get graded for these whether you get them right or wrong. I just want to know how much you've learned by the at the end. Obviously, you can see, you're going to see some of these questions later, so you might want to make sure you know them. Okay, here's genetic terminology, and it's important that you understand each of these bullet points because they're essential to understanding the process. And as you learned from me on your final, and I'm sure some of you have to go back and. Look at that final again. Uh, but as you learn on your final, if you don't understand the process, you're not going to be able to answer the questions. And that's really the key here. So as you're looking at this genetic terminology, any characteristic can be passed from one parent to the off to us offspring. What is that? Answer it. Figure it out. Write it down. Know what the answer is to each of these so that you can continue going on. Some of these are real easy, like the study of heredity. I mean... You should know it's genetics. I mean, that's just simple. Some things you, sh you should have learned already. Two forms of a gene, dominant and recessive. What would they be called? You already know this, or you should know it. Uh, we've talked about it already. Stronger of two genes expressed in a hybrid. You know what that is, a stronger version. And when they say stronger, they mean the one that shows up the most, all right? Shows up, the one that you actually see. It's not an actual competition of of strength is what you see when when the two when you have two of them and they're different uh, and I'll go ahead and give you this because it's an important idea so I'm going to go ahead and say this is and they're all important but and we'll just say it's an allele all right so two forms of the same gene is an allele and the one that's stronger right the one that's stronger quote unquote is the one that shows up and what we call that it's if there's and when they say hybrid that means when you have two of them so if you have a big a and a little a it's the big a that shows up if we're talking about dominant right so when we're talking about dominant you have to remember it's the one that shows up is called dominant it's not really stronger per se it's just the one that works better remember a gene is something that codes for a protein and a protein is an enzyme so whatever protein works better if one if big a gives you a protein that looks like this and little a gives you a protein that looks like this and a this protein works better this one works not so good then this one is dominant because this one's going to show up and i shouldn't even say works good or works bad it's the one that shows up because the one that shows up might be something that doesn't work as well so it's the one that shows up is the one the one that you see as a trait when there's a heterozygote when there's a big a and a little a we call that dominant all right all right so a gene that shows up less often in a cross represented by lowercase we call that recessive so just two key words so that when i can when i continue on i can talk about dominant recessive the rest of these you should be able to write down and figure out and they're important terms that you're going to need to know so when I'm talking about it in class or when you're looking at it up uh, in, in questions you understand the concept all right so here's a cross and yes I have a cold this this sign this stuff is not letting me go so just stop making fun of me all right so where we have a sperm and an egg and you have, they're segregating big R, little r, big R, little r. Uh, again, the big R means it shows up more often. And so if you have these two, which one are you going to see? You're going to see big R. What is big R? What does big R represent? It could be anything. It could be red hair. It could be uh, round face. It could be tall, short, or whatever. The R is a variable. And if it's big, it means it shows up if there's a little one present. If you have a big one and a little one, the big one's the one you see. All right, that's all we're talking about here. Now, when you're talking about the sperm, remember every organism has two copies of a chromosome. So if these R's are on chromosome number one, if you find 
that the variable r, this gene for whatever it is, let's say it's round face, is found here and this position in on chromosome number one. Every organism has two chromosomes, right? Two chromosomes, all right? And two chromosome number ones. Two chromosomes of every chromosome, every organism has them, we call them diploid, right? <laughs> So when we make when we make our haploid cells, when we when we sit down and we make go through meiosis, by now you should know, and I'll go ahead and draw it over here on the side. You have one cell that has two chromosome number ones. It goes through synthesis through the cell cycle, the S phase, and it makes two copies. So you have two chromosomes. Each one is chromosome number one. And we know there's 28 of them, right? But we're just going to look at chromosome number one. And when it starts to go through meiosis at prophase, they line up. And each of these chromosomes could have the same gene type, the same, the same allele. That's why I wanted to use the word allele above. Or it could have a different uh, allele. So let's say this chromosome number one that came from this creature's mom has a, a small r. The other one is a big R. So this one here has a small r. And remember that when we go through meiosis, there's crossing over. So little, little pieces of one chromatid can switch with another. So we end up at the end of meiosis with two cells. We could have in one cell, we could have one chromosome number one with a chromatid that looks like so, that has a bit of little r. So it used to be, what used to be little r, little r here, and big r, big r here, right? Now we have little r here, and big r here, and in the end, over here, you have a big R, and on this one, uh, you have a little r, because it originally had a little r, but this one switched. This piece here switched as it crossed over. When these two cells then, when each of these divides, this one divides into two, right? It's going to give you a sperm that has a chromosome with big R. This one gives you a sperm that has a chromosome number one with little r. This one over here, these two divide again into two, right? And this one has a big R. And this one has little r. So when we're looking at this and we see Four possibilities, four possible sperm that can turn into an and can turn into a human being, right? Four different sperm that can turn into four different human beings. What is it that we're dealing with? We're dealing with if this one is the one that turns into you, you have a big R. If this one turns into one that's big, turns into you, that's a big R. If this one turns into one that's that's you, that's a little R. And if this one turns into one that's you, this is your sperm that became you, then you have a little r. So what are your odds of getting uh, of getting that big r or what are the odds of getting the little r? Well, it's two out of four or reduced two out of four. Two out of four reduced equals what? One, uh, one out of two, so 50-50. That's where we get these 50-50s from. That's where this 50 and this this half comes from. So you can get one, you can get, there's a half, there's a half, 50% uh, chance that you're going to get a number one chromosome that has, that has a big R. And there's a 50% chance that you're going to have a number one chromosome that has a little r. And the same thing goes on the other for your mom for your eggs, right? So your mom could give you a big R, a chromosome number one with a big R. These are all chromosome number ones, right? Or they can, or mom could give you. Uh, I'm sorry, that should have been a little R. 
So mom could give you uh, a chromosome number one that has a little r, or she could give you a chromosome number one that has a big r. So it's all connected, right? So in meiosis, you learned that you produce four gametes. In eggs, three of them become polar bodies, but that's regardless. No matter what, you have two versions of the chromosome, one from your dad and one from your mom. And when you're making your eggs or your sperm, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to give mom your mom's version or your dad's version to the your offspring. So if you're a boy, you're going to either have a sperm that has a big R or a sperm that has a little R. If you're a girl, you have an egg that has a big R and an egg that has a little R. And you're donating these when you're when you're making a baby. You're either going to produce one qu- a baby. There's a 25 percent chance here that you're going to get uh, big R, big R, and a 25 percent chance you're going to get your 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 zygote's going to have big R, little R. So that's what these mean. That's how all this is connected. Okay, so there's some fundamentals of genetics you need to know. Try to answer these again. It's in the reading. It's in chapter three. I'm going to go ahead and tell you some basics, and that's that there's, if this is you, right, and there's a height, there's a, there's a hangman little, there's a hangman version of you, there's eye, there's all kinds of traits that make you up, right, your eye color, uh, your eye color, your, your hair color and shape and texture, your, uh, your, your height, right, your, your uh, your uh, hand, your size, your intelligence, your all kinds of things. These are all traits, and traits have really two big influences. There's two big things that impact those traits. There's one, which is the simplest one, really, and I know it's kind of odd to say that, even though, and some of you may not feel that way after the final, but it's the simplest one, and that's your genes, because the genes are just codes in your DNA. And they're either going to work or they're not, and they're going to determine a specific thing. And we can, we can sequence it, we can identify it, we can point to it, we can color it. I mean, we can do all kinds of things to it. So the genes is one big influence in your lives, right? So that's your genetic side. And often we call we call these uh, we call these genes nature. They're what you inherit. You can't really you can't really go around that. So that's the primary, and uh, maybe it's not the most important, and some people really think it's not the most important. So, you know, what percentage is, how, how big an importance is this? Uh, maybe it's the most important, maybe it's not the most important, but it's certainly one of the two big influences. The second influence uh, that influences these things, right? And we talked a lot about genes and about proteins, but the second influence that influences these is your environment, all right, and your environment probably has as much to do with who you become and how big you are, how small you are, a lot of things, how well you develop. All these traits probably have as in as a big an impact on on who you become as as your genes do. And this environment we like to say is your is your is how you're nurtured, right? So if, if your nature is your genes, then how you're nurtured is your environment. So nurturing, right? So you're, you have your, your nurture, right? So you have nature versus nurture. And then you'll hear that a lot in, in your life, nature versus nurture. How much of who you are is your genes? And how much of who you are is how you were raised. or And that includes how much you've eaten, what kinds of food you've eaten, how much water, the quality of your water. Did you let, eat? you know, did you, you could have the genes to be a supreme genius. But if you were licking paint uh, chips off the wall when you're a baby and you have lead in your system, you're not that bright. And the reason that is, is because the lead inf- uh, actually uh, impacts your cognitive ability. We know that that particular environmental influence, that nurture part of you growing up, could influence your intelligence, right? So your genes are an important part of what happens, but also your environment, how you're raised, how hard you work, is just as important as the genes that make you up. 
Now, the genes can limit you, right? There are some, there are physical realities. For instance, we've talked about some extreme examples where children are born uh, without heads or without brains, right? Or children are born uh, with flipper feet, right? They, or will they ever be a Michael Jordan if they're, if they have uh, no legs? Well, I mean, okay, no, but those are extreme examples. And maybe they won't be a Michael Jordan, but they could do something else. And that's all true. Uh, but the point is that genes can limit you. They can limit you to some extent. Nurture often the environment, what you do after you're born, not the stuff that happened before you were born. Again, another example why we call it nature, because it's stuff that you had before you were born, back when you were conceived. This stuff that happens after you're born can influence your abilities. They can, they can, they can improve them. You can change your outcome. In many cases, especially if it's not an extreme, especially if it's not one of those extreme differences, the extreme changes, extreme effects. All right, let's go on. So these are the two big ideas that they're talking about on this page. Now here uh, for the for Gregor Mendel, you really have to uh, read this, read the reading in chapter three, and understand his experiments and what he did. Uh, you know, he was a monk, he's an Austrian monk, a religious man, but he loved math, he loved botany, he loved growing things in the garden. Uh, these peas were the big example of, he got very lucky because some, as I told you in class, some, some plants don't have a really easy way of inheriting things. It turns out these peas are either dominant or recessive and for many of their traits. So as we looked at seed shape, he saw a big R, a little R. When he looked at seed color, he saw a big Y, a little Y. So all the inheritance of these particular peas was either dominant or recessive, okay? And you can answer all these questions yourself as you're going through. He kept very logical, method, methodology, a very, very method-based uh, science where he took very clear and detailed notes on what he saw and he was very careful in what he did and an amazing scientist and published his, his results in an Austrian paper and, and only discovered later in life after his death only dis his work was only then was his work discovered and appreciated but he really described the inheritance pattern he described that idea that we already talked about the idea of independent assortment right this idea that that these he didn't know what these things were all right so let's get that clear let's be clear on that so but even though he didn't know what they were he knew that they they acted as if they were independent of one another you didn't always have two s's together you didn't always have the two r the big r little r together they could they could assort they can be found in the progeny in the children independent of any other characteristic so you can have round and green and uh, tall plants, right? So you have a tall plant with round green peas, you know. Uh, this, so these these traits were independent. They can be inherited independently of one another. And we know that, we know why that is because we already looked at the whys. We looked at much deeper than, than Mr. Mendel, than, than the, uh, the monk Mendel even dared, had even imagined probably. He didn't even imagine some of the stuff that you know already that you learned about chromosomes and meiosis. Uh, what he was looking at was a result of meiosis. He just looked at they're round or they're green or they're wrinkled. He looked at something called traits, right? So he looked at traits and he said traits can be, you know, these can be independently inherited. He said they can be dominant, they can be recessive. And when they're dominant, it's the ones that show up. If you always, if you have, you know, if you, and he talked about something called, uh, you know, uh, uh, homologous, uh, traits, or rather uh, homozygous, right? He talked about these ideas of uh, homozygous, homozygous, uh, or heterozygous, right? And zygous came from the zygote, right? So that if the zygote was homoz homozygote, he was, they had both the same gene, both the same alleles. So they had either, you know, they had a big A, big A, or you had a little A, little A. They're both the same, right? Where a heterozygous just meant you had a one big A and one little A, so you have one of each. 
See, Mendel, because he got lucky because this particular plant only did big or small. You'll see later uh, on in this unit, you'll see that actually these things can do more than just be dominant and recessive. They can be co-dominant. In other words, they can both show up. Or they can be incomplete dominant, where you get kind of a blending. But in any case, to start off with, he, with as far as Mendel was concerned, he got very lucky. These traits didn't do all that. They were either round or they were wrinkled. There was, you know, there wasn't uh, a blending going on. So he could identify this dominant and recessive trait, and he could quantify it. He could do a Punnett square. He could come up with the probability of each of these happening. Now, he didn't do a Punnett square because he didn't know how it was inherited. He did giant tables and collected pages and pages and books of data. On, because imagine that these, these peas take a whole season to grow. He spent many, many years in that garden growing these peas and crossing them and collecting that data and so that he could come up with these laws that he, made, that he finally developed and, and defined. And you know the answer to these. You know, you know the idea of the karyotype. You know that humans each have two sets of what chromosomes in their somatic body cells and about 30,000 genes. You know, two sets of what? Two sets of what? You know that. Now, different forms of or types of specific genes are called what? And we already, again, I defined it for you already. And, and so these are just, this should be kind of an uh, overview or review. Homozygous and heterozygous, I just defined for you just a minute, again, a minute ago. And again, if you read in chapter three, you'll see the answers for all of these. Based on what I just said, based on what you studied already in meiosis and mitosis, and based on your chapter reading and the other two movies that I sent you earlier, they're much shorter than this, you should be able to answer all of these. And... Uh, Again, you should know what all these are. I don't. I, there's nothing else I can say without giving away all the answers. So, um, some detailed stuff you might want to make sure you understand is. So the first allele, and when you have a, when in this case in this question, this is something again that you have to kind of read in the chapter. But when present or uh, when a parent, two parents come together, and they produce, when they come together and they produce some offspring. Right, you've seen this kind of chart before. It's a pedigree, and these are parents. And of course, this is already wrong because it should be one square. When the square is the boy, the round's the girl. Uh, that's how it's done. So square is going to be female, and the. Uh, I'm sorry, I just said, I just said it backwards. Uh, the square is going to be male, and this round one's going to be female. All right. So when you're looking at this, and these are these are crosses that are happening here, your first generation, the first generation of offspring, is known as the filial, the first filial, filial organization, blah, blah, and that's the F1, the F1 generation. So we say F1, right? And the F1 generation is cross when you cross this one with another one of their generation. So you know when you're talking about peas, you can do this. It's not really a good idea for humans to do this, but you can produce kind of this going on, right? This generation is called the F2 generation, and etc. But the first parent or, or the first parents are known as the P generation or P1, all right? Generation. So. That's pretty much what they mean by F and P. So whenever you see that P is the parent, the first parental or, uh, organisms, the F1 and F2 are the following generations. Okay, I'm going to do this example, Mendel's experiments with you. And it says here that Mendel produced pure strains by allowing the plants to self-pollinate for several generations. And what that meant is that if he had, uh, you know, tall plants... Uh, he let and he mixed it with another tall plant and he just let them he let him have the interesting thing about plants is they can pollinate themselves so they can they can make both sperm and egg. in this particular species they they can make both sperm and egg and by having them cross and, and just continuously mate with themselves for several generations what he did is he produced plants that were 
purely tall. You know, there's two big T's. There was no heterozygous or homozygous for, for this tall gene. So this generation was the parental generation, right? The first, the first parental generation or P1 strain. And it, then Mendel cro uh, cross-pollinated the two strains and tracked each trait through two generations, right? So he took these he took these self-pollinating plants. So he had these plants that were always tall. He knew they were this. He called them big T, big T. And he had these plants that were always short. And he called those little T, little T. After several generations, no matter how many times they self-pollinated, they always were short or they always were tall. And he thought, well, I got this purebred, purebred. We call them purebred, right? We do this with dogs and cats. We got these purebred plants that we call tall. We have these purebred plants that are short. What happens if I cross these two? That's right, all right. So, uh, plant height is going to be t. The symbol of it, the variable is going to be t. Uh, so, a tall one's going to be big t, and the short one's going to be little t. All right. So, tall is big t, and big t because it's big. Even if it's there's only, even if it's heterozygous, it's big t, little t. It's still going to be big because this is the dominant trait, right? We've learned that. Now, Mendel didn't know that at the time. He he just came up with these variables, and he said, let's see what happens. Little t is short, and we'll call we'll say that there's these two things, and he knows that they're probably two things, and he didn't know what they were. We know they're, they're alleles today, but he didn't know that then. And he had the P1 cross, where he took the big T, big T, and he crossed it with a little t, little t. And so... What again? This goes back to that that developing those gametes. There was a fifty percent chance that this parent could give a big T, and another fifty percent chance that they could give the other little t big T. But remember, that's all that 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 plant had to give. It was it was a purebred plant, right? So plant height plant height itself is we know is a gene, right? And the fact that there's two, either tall or short, we call these alleles today. Uh, he didn't know that at the time. You know, they, he did, at the time Mendel didn't know that, but we know that today. And the other short plant could only give a little t, little t. Well, if this particular sperm hit this particular egg, then you had big t, little t. If this sperm hit this egg, you hit, you got big t, little t. If this sperm hit this egg, you got big T, little t. And if this sperm had this egg, you got big T, little t. So if his calculations were correct, then when he mixed a big, every, and this is what he saw, he saw that every time he mixed a purebred tall with a purebred short, he got all talls. All of them were tall. That's where he got the idea that tall must be dominant. And his, his observations were that every time he mixed a tall, a purebred tall with a purebred short, they were all tall. So he said the tall must be a dominant. It must, since it shows up all the time, tall is dominant. That should be pretty easy to understand, right? He didn't understand what those were, these things, these, these, these characteristics, these whatever they were. Every time that you mixed it, tall plant with a short plant, purebred tall with a purebred short, you always end up with tall plants. So the F1 the F1 generation, which is inside these little boxes, their F1 genotypic ratio was 100%. 100%. Right? Big T, little t. So four out of four. You know, 100% big T, little t. The phenotypic ratio was 100% tall, right? Or, you know, that's, that's all there was, 1 to 0. The offspring of this cross were all what? The offspring of this all were all heterozygous. So if you did your work before we got to this point, and you're not just skipping around. You understand what I mean by heterozygous. If you're trying to, if you're just trying to come in here and 
and uh, answer questions and just fill in blanks, that's great, but that's not going to help you on the test, all right? This whole activity is supposed to help you on your exams to help you understand the process. So hopefully you, you've learned these vocabulary words before you've gotten to this point in the slide. So these are heterozygous. And there sh I should say heterozygous, so. Showing only the tall plants. So they were heterozygous, 100% heterozygous, and all you saw was tall, and were called the F1 generation, right? So, you know, that's, it was uh, one, uh, four tall to zero short, if you wanted to actually get down to ratios, and phenotypic ratios is four tall, uh, or four Really, if you really wanted to get the possibilities of homozygous recessive or heterozygous, it was all four were, uh, you had, I should say, zero big T, big T's to four big T, little T's to zero little T, little T. That was your actual ratio. And you had four tall to zero short were your actual ratios. But we can express these ratios as percentages. You can say 100% heterozygous, which is what this is, or 100% tall, which is what this is. So ratio can be expressed with, with these colons. They could also be expressed as fractions, uh, or they could be expressed as percentages. So then Mendel did something interesting is he said, okay, well, they're all tall, but what would happen if I took one of these uh, plants and crossed them with one of these plants, right? And what, should, what would I get? And he did the experiment and that experiment was produced a sec an F2 generation, right? So your F1 cross, which would have been what? what would have been What would have been your F1 cross? Uh, this was known as an F1 cross, right? And what is that F1 cross? Well, he would say it would be a big T, little t crossed with a big T, little t, right? Where you had big T for plant and short, where the plant was, the trait is, the trait is plant's height. The alleles are either tall or short. And since they're all tall and you have 100% big T, little t, those are your parents, so one big T goes here, one little T goes here, one big T goes here, one little T goes here. Well, what are your percent, what's your ratio, what are, what's going to be the outcome? What are the possibilities? Well, you could have a, a child that has one big T, two big T's, as if dad gave this and mom gave that, that's what you'd have. But dad could get, mom could give this and dad the little T. And by the way, we always put the big letter first. It's just a convention. It doesn't really matter. And here you put big T, little t, because that's what dad and mom can give. And over here, mom and dad can give little t, little t. So what are your ratios? Let's look at the ratios and then let's do the percentages, right? All right, so what are your percentage homozygous dominant? Well, it would be one, right? One homozygous dominant, there it is, right here. There's your homozygous dominant. Uh, that would be to what one to what one to two and what would that be that would be this one and this one right and there's your two which is represented by the heterozygotes or you could have then uh, you could have the homozygous recessive which in turn would be only one of those, right? So those are your three possibilities. Either you have uh, a, a homozygous dominant, a heterozygous, or homozygous recessive. Those are your those are your three options. If you're talking about phenotypic ratios, well, what what are your phenotypic? Again, phenotype means phenotype means what you see and what are your phenotypic ratios 
Well, all three of these, I hope you can understand that all three of those are going to be what? What are all three of these going to be? They all have a dominant gene. They're all going to be tall. All three of these are tall because it's either dominant or recessive. So we call this phenotypic ratio. They're three tall to one, right? Three to one. Because... When we're talking about these, we have to say that all three of these are tall because they all have they all have this tall gene. And we have to say that there's only one short because only one of them has two small t's. And so there's your small. So three to one tall to short, right? And what are the percentages then? If you have to think about this, so please think about it. Your percentages are going to be 25%, one out of four, big T. Big T, you have 50% heterozygous, that's big T, little t. And then you have another 25% little t, little t, which is homozygous recessive. Those are your only possibilities in a dominant and recessive situation. And if you're crossing two, two heterozygotes, two, if you're only crossing two heterozygotes, then you're talking about these ratios. These are the percentages. You have a one to two to one, and you have these percentages. <coughs> a phenotypic ratio is easier. You can look at it, and, and, and kind of as soon as you make a punny square, you should be able to do it. It's three tall and one short. And phenotype is what you see, the trait that you see. Or a genotype is your genes, the type of genes you have. What are those types of genes? It's either, in this case, it's either big, a big T, or it's a little T, right? That's all you got. So now, and here you see the percentages. They're all listed down here. When two hybrids were crossed, you had 75% or three fourths, three out of four. You see three out of four here. One, one, two, three out of four are uh, uh, were tall. The, they show the dominant trait, and only twenty-five po show the recessive trait. Twenty-five percent or one out of four. So your percentage here is, you know, when we're talking about percentages. It's seventy-five percent tall and let me do that again 75% tall and 25% short okay two hybrids always create a two if you cross two hybrids they're always going to create a homozygous recessive and they're always going to create homozygous dominant they're always going to create two heterozygous the offspring of this cross were called the and I hope you know that they're the F2 generation right so they're always going to produce a homozygous recessive homozygous dominant they're always going to produce that whenever you cross two heterozygous no matter what the inheritance pattern, you're always no matter what it how they how you inherit them, dominant recessive, codominant, whatever, you're always going to produce one at least one recessive, at least one dominant, all right, and you're always going to produce a heterozygote. You're always going to produce two heterozygotes, all right. So you're going to produce one dominant, one recessive, and two heterozygotes. I hope you get that from this activity. Inheritable material are responsible for all inheritable characteristics, and we can call those genes. Okay. Right? Or alleles. And your traits, the things you see, 
are de are based on your genes or versions of those genes that we call alleles and alleles or, or genes right the types of genes you, you have is based on your parents one from mother and the other from the father the true breeding individuals are homozygous so true breeding means purebred right true breeding individuals means they they're, they're homozygous both alleles are the same Right. Either they could either be big 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 T, big T, or they could be little T, little T. They're both home, they're both true breeding. They're always if you cross this one with another true little T, little T, that's all you're gonna get is little T, little T. All you're gonna get is short. The three laws that he developed, and the first uh, you can come up with those. You can find those yourself. But the loss the first law states that when different alleles of our characters are inherit are inherited heterozygous. The, tra the trait of only one, the dominant one, will be expressed. That recessive trait's phenotype only appears in true breeding homozygous individuals. So there's three laws. They have names. You have to find them. I'm going to let you find them. But know the laws for sure. I'm not going to sit here and go through the whole, every question with you. I'm trying to give you some background so you feel a little more confident in searching out the rest of this. So here's some great uh, examples of inherited, dominant, recessive, inherited traits in humans. Okay, no, uh, no cleft or cleft in chin. Uh, no cleft in chin is dominant and cleft in chin is recessive. Hitchhiker's uh, thumb is recessive. Straight thumb is dominant. Hair on the back of your hand is dominant. No hair on the back of your hand is recessive. Uh, inability to fold the tongue, uh, that means kind of horizontally, so when you fold it, you know, you form like a little channel in your tongue. The ability to fold the tongue is recessive. The tongue roller, uh, either you roll your tongue back or not roll it. Uh, Non-roller is recessive. Dark hair is dominant over light hair. Uh, anything, any other color hair is dominant over red hair, so red hair is recessive. Widow's peak, and that's kind of when you have... A hairline and you kind of have hair that comes out like this 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 uh, hairline that comes here when it sticks out I would call that a widow's peak uh, white forelock normal hair I uh, see so a forelock is it you have a streak of white hair we call, that's dominant over over normal hair Freckles is dominant over over normal or no freckles. Dimples are dominant over no dimples. Brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. Normal eyesight is is dominant over nearsightedness. Almond shaped eyes over are dominant over round eyes. Long eyelashes are dominant over short eyelashes. Blood uh, broad nostrils are dominant over narrow nostrils. Roman nose is dominant over straight nose. Uh, free earlobe is dominant over an attached, and you can see here, this is an attached earlobe. This is a free earlobe, kind of hangs down, and this is the the hitchhiker's thumb here versus a thumb that doesn't do that little curly cue at the tip. Free uh, bent little fingers uh, are are are, are uh, dominant over parallel ones. Left over right uh, left over right thumb is is uh, dominant over right over left thumb. Uh, I'm not even sure what that is, so I'll have to look that up. A and B blood group is dominant over O. Uh, RH blood group is dominant over RH negative. Normal blood clotting is dominant over hemophilia, and normal is dominant over allergies. Mm -hmm. And what we have here, so these are just kind of a key for you to kind of look at the different kinds of characteristics even in your own family as you're doing this over Christmas you're going to meet a lot of your family members you can think maybe what kind of what kind of characteristics do they have that are dominant or recessive and you have fraternal versus identical twins a lot of you keep asking me about this and we've I kind of explained it in class uh, you guys can answer that again that's all in your chapter 3 reading There are a number of different diseases that can be inherited. HIV can be inherited uh, 
by a child in front of an infected mom. There's a this inheritance though is not genetic. Uh, this is passed on. The HIV can be passed on. So I'm I'm not really sure where the writers of this project actually meant for you to go with this particular section. So I'll just ask you to go ahead and just ignore this whole section here. I don't I don't like where they're going or, or I'm not sure what they mean to say. I can tell you this that in its to replace it, let me say this that some diseases can be inherited, but when they're inherited, we're talking about genes, right? So something that impacts the genes can then be inherited from a father to son or from mother to daughter or from mother to son. Uh, viruses do incorporate their DNA into cells, uh, but HIV attacks white blood cells. So I can't imagine how this DNA in HIV could possibly get into a sperm or an egg since they don't really attack, the virus doesn't attack that particular, uh, that particular cell type. So genes can be inserted into, into a child's genome. Uh, viruses can be, the DNA in viruses are inherited, can be inherited. And I suppose HIV in some odd fashion could end up in, a, a, in, a in an egg or a sperm, though I'm not sure how. Uh, the common cold won't be passed on because it only attacks your nasal cavities. Uh, but again, I still don't understand why they would say it can be passed on to offspring. I mean, the disease can be because it can uh, your mother's blood could mix with the child's blood. It can pass a placental barrier. So, uh, sure, it could enter the, the baby's bloodstream, but could it actually incorporate into nascent cells? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so in any case, here you have disorders resulting from abnormal structure and function. Uh, body organs are likely, uh, you know, I'm not sure where they're going with this, you know, because abnormal structure or function of body organs could be environmental because remember we talked about two possibilities, nature or nurture. And the thing about nurture is that you can imagine if you, uh, if your mother was exposed to some toxin, it could it could impact the structure and the function of your body organs. Uh, so probably equally would be the answer I would say. I mean, perhaps the answer is more likely to be genetic, um, just because of how often it happens. But realistically, there's an equal chance that any disorder. A function or structure or structure or function could end up being an environmental or nurture versus nature your genes some disorders are associated with genes are diabetes these are for sure this is all correct and we've gone over sickle cell and how that works we've talked about down syndrome being three copies of chromosome 21 and diabetes we haven't really talked about yet but we will uh but these are all inherited and they're all based on genes and there's many of them, many, many, many of them. So I suppose you could say if there's a problem with structure or function of organs, it probably is more likely to be uh, nature because I can imagine there's probably a lot of diseases that are inherited that are uh, problems with structure and function. But I'm not sure I, I like the wording of this question, so don't worry too much about this showing up in your on your exam uh, in the third quarter. Uh, we will learn more about genetic disorders. That's true, and you've already learned a lot more than they're discussing here. We're, we're following a different sequence. So here, sex determination. Blank determines the sex of the individual, and it's going to be your sex chromosomes. So remember, we talked about this. Mom can only give you an X because she only has two Xs. Dad, the sex chromosomes are the only chromosomes where, they, where you could have two different types. So even though they're sex chromosomes, you can have an X or you can have a Y. And uh, dad is the only one that can give you a Y. So it turns out that at least part of the way, uh, we could, dad is who determines, is that Y that determines uh, the sex of an individual because all the rest of the possibilities are X, right? Uh, so XX produces a girl, XY a boy, um, the sex chromosomes, right?
uh, determine the sex of the individual. Note X chromosomes contain additional genetic information and Y chromosome doesn't that Y chromosome doesn't have. Therefore, when you a, a male has actually extra DNA, extra stuff that the female does not have. So the male has everything the female has in a sense, but uh, it also a male also has this extra DNA in the Y chromosome. I have to say there is an advantage to having two X's for the female. And that's that uh, the female randomly shuts one of these two X's off because you don't want double the amount of the particular uh, uh, material, the genes on these chromosomes. So they'll automatically shut one of these two off randomly. And I've discussed that with you before. And the advantage of that is if there's a disease on one of these X's, there only half your cells will have that disease gene being being expressed. Where if that where if that gene, let's say color blindness, ends up being on the X chromosome, on the X chromosome actually, uh, color blindness. If you're a male, you can't shut this off. So it turns out males turn out to be more uh, more often colorblind than females because females randomly shut that gene off. And if they shut this gene off, this chromosome off, then all they have is a good gene. So females actually have to inherit both X's with that with that colorblind gene in order to get that colorblind eyesight. So males end up being more colorblind than females, more often colorblind than females. So it's an interesting dilemma. We call this sex-linked traits or X-linked traits. And the, any of these traits that are in the X, the females have an opportunity to 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 dilute the impact of a disease gene where the males don't have that opportunity. So there's a real strong advantage to having two X's. Uh, but there is extra DNA on this Y chromosome that the female does not have. So sex-linked traits are traits that are found more in one sex than the other. Uh, so, and that usually, what that usually turns out to be, uh, uh, it's usually in males. Again, because of what I talked about, when you have two X's, uh, you're more, you're less likely to have a disease than if someone has an any gene that's on your X, and then if you only have one copy of that X gene. So, you know, if you have, if your mother had the diseased X, that colorblind X, or your father, let's say, that gave you a colorblind X, but your mom gave you one that wasn't colorblind, then you're not going to have that colorblindness in your, uh, in your eyes. Uh, but if that, if your mom gave you that colorblind gene, she's not colorblind because she had a good X to work with. But she ended up giving you that X for color blindness. Your dad gave you the Y. So you're more likely to have the disease if you're a male. Um, and that goes for hemophilia too. Also an excellent trait. Uh, there are some Y, there are some genes, some issues that happen on the Y genes and the genes that are found on the Y chromosome. Uh, of course, those are only inherited by males. So no matter, the male gets hit twice. With sex link traits, the male is the one that gets to hit the most. Uh, so any kind of sex link diseases are going to be more often happening in males than in females. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, where these traits generally do or do not show up, we have to talk about these traits not showing up in uh in heterozygotes and or in not showing up in females, right? So these these interestingly diseased uh, genes don't tend not to show up in females. And they're recessive. Most of these are recessive. Uh, most of these sex length diseases are recessive to the normal condition. And they, they don't seem to be on the Y. So if you can say, if you can think about the recessive for a couple of reasons, but whatever, this disease is recessive here, you have the dominant form here, 
where if you get the recessive on the X, you don't have those genes on the Y. So there's no dominant form for you to be able to help you uh, get over that issue. All right, so here's that Punnett square deal again with the big R, little r. We talked about it earlier. Uh, and we're talking about gametes here, right? So either either sperm or eggs with either a combination of big R or little r. Now, when we're doing a test cross, this is an interesting point and very important. If you don't know, if you know, for instance, that something's tall, Let's go with tall because we talked about that as a big T. And you don't know if that second one, you don't know what that second one is. Is this second allele big T or is it little t? Well, you can, you can cross it with a homozygous recessive. So you take that and you can cross it with a little t, little t, a short plant, true breeding short plant. Because when you do that, when you do that, then you have big T question mark and you're crossing it with a little t, little t. There's only two possibilities, right? There's only going to be a small t or it's a big T. That's the only two possibilities. So when you have, you know that at least 50% are going to be heterozygous because you know it's tall. So 50% tall. If you get 100%... You do this a thousand times, you get a hundred percent tall. Then you know that this second, this second allele is probably, is probably a T, a big T, because then you get a hundred percent tall. Now, if you did the same cross, and again, it's a test cross, and this was a small t instead of a big t what would you get what are the possibilities well you get big t you get a bunch of tall ones but you'd also get a 50 percent short so 50 percent are going to be short and 50 percent tall so in a test cross you ought to the, the test cross is to figure out is this is this parent is this heterozygous is it hetero is this is this uh is this parent gonna be is this parent heterozygous or is it a homozygous dominant? So when we're talking about doing a test cross, you have a dominant trait, so you can't tell whenever you have a dominant trait, you can't tell what that second gene is until you cross it with a homozygous recessive. And if you that's called this this is what a test cross is. This is called a test cross because you only have two possibilities in a test cross. You either have the dominant heterozygous form, and if you cross it with a recessive, you're going to get a 50-50 result, right? As you can see here, you have 50% tall, and you'll have 50% short. Now, if the other the other possibility is that this tall that when you do this test cross, this cross with the homozygous recessive, that that second allele is also dominant, in which case what you would expect to see if the other one was is dominant, uh, dominant, homozygous dominant, is 100% tall. So those are your two possibilities in a test cross. And that's why we call it a test cross, because you're testing what is this second allele. And the only way to do it really is to cross, without doing some genetic testing, is the uh, molecular testing, is to go ahead and cross it with something that's short. As you say, you cannot tell by looking at an organism that shows the dominant trait, you can tell by something that shows the recessive trait because you know it's two, two recessive alleles. But something that's showing the dominant trait, you can't tell the genotype. You can't tell whether it's heterozygous or homozygous. To determine the genotype of the, you, you, of the organism, you uh, the dominant trait uh, 
determine the genotype of an organism showing the dominant trait, a test crossed would be done, right? And blank equals the organism unknown dominant genotype is crossed with a, and this is of course the test cross. Is crossed with a with a uh, homozygous recessive. organism. So that should take care of that slide and I think it's pretty clear what the test cross is. I hope that's clear. Uh, it's the Punnett square which we've already covered and sex link traits and these are kind of the keys to sex link traits. Three major major ideas you really need to understand. So again I'm going to go ahead and give and do this one with you. A black coat color of guinea pigs is dominant over white coat color. Look at the example one across below. So here's black traits, big B, and you have uh, white coats, little b. So black trait is going to have a big B, and it could be big B what? Well, it could be big B, big B, or big B, little b. We're not sure if you have a white trait, it's little b, right? Uh, hybrid black, a hybrid meaning uh, heterozygous. So you have hybrid black would be big B, little b, and hybrid uh, uh, another hybrid black would be big B, little b. So you have P1, uh, P1 cross of these two, uh, which would, again, be uh, big B, little b, and you're crossing it with uh, big B, uh, little b. Now, it's important for you to note that, in that right next to this example that I'm doing here, there is another example. Uh, we do have this one where we looked at a hybrid black with a pure white, so little b, little b, big b, big b, and they did the, they did all the, they did the Punnett square, they did the genotypes and the phenotypes. So we'll go ahead and do it here, big b, little b, cross with big b, little b. So this is going to be you know mom, and this one's dad, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. So we have big B and the little B because mom can give a big B or a little B and the same thing with dad. And so here, this would be big B, big B. Here would be big B, little B because this one could give because, you know, mom could give mom could give either big B or little B and uh, our dad can give either big B or little B, and mom can give big B or little B. That's all they have to give. So as we look at the possible combinations, we see what we get in genotypes of the offspring are going to be, it's going to be the ratio 1 homozygous dominant to 2 heterozygote to, to 1 homozygote recessive. Or we could also say, Or we could also say another op another way of saying it is that we can have 25% homozygous dominant, and we can have 50% heterozygote, and we'll have 25% homozygous recessive. All right. So phenotypic ratios here, uh, even though we have all these possibilities for genotypes. Phenotypes, we're really dealing with 75% uh, uh, black. Yes, they're hybrid, but you can't tell that by looking at them. And 25% uh, white. And another way of saying that is three blacks, two, one white. Three to one ratio or percentages either way you look at it all right let's take a look at the next so here's some more crosses for you to do you can do this on your own these are practice for you here's a monohybrid practice so again here's some crosses you can do uh, and 
And then let's go ahead and read this first one. So I'll do A with you. And you say, see, homozygous, I'll set up A for you. So homozygous black, homozygous black. And they're looking at you saying, uh, crossing guinea pigs, hair, black hair is dominant over white. Uh, pure black is big B, big B, little B, little, uh, big B, little B is hybrid, and little B, little B is dominant recessive. Determine the genotypes and phenotypes of each cross. Well, if it's homozygous black, uh, black is dominant, then you know that this is big B, big B. And if it's homozygous black is the other opportunity, then we're again, we're talking about big B, big B. Pure white and pure white, you should be able to tell that what that is. Pure black and pure white. Again, when they say pure black, it's the same thing as saying same thing as saying homozygous. And pure white is also the same thing as saying homozygous. All right, homozygous and pure, that's what they mean by that. I don't like the word pure, but whatever. Uh, hybrid black versus homozygous black. Uh, hybrid black. What are we talking about here? We're talking about big B, little b. Homozygous black is your big B, big B. So here in this one, it's hybrid means, I'm going to go ahead and do this one here for you, big B, little b, and heterozygous is the same thing as saying hybrid. So you see heterozygous is also known as hybrid, okay? So for each of these, you go ahead and do your Punnett square, uh, do a Punnett square, just like I did on the previous uh, section, put one parent, one side of the X here, over here, and the other side of the X on the other one and see what happens with your with your offspring and determine the ratios and the percentages. Because each parent and offspring are using blank traits, uh, uh, each should have four alleles for each. Uh, so here we're talking about two traits. So we call these dihybrid crosses, it's a little bit different. Uh, so you have to have four alle uh, so what we're talking about here is is simply that each when we're dealing with two traits now we have red hair and uh, round eyes if you're talking about round eyes and red hair You have two traits, so red hair might be big R, little r, or in this case, we know red hair is recessive, so we can say little r, little r for red hair. And round eyes might be, uh, is recessive, so maybe round eyes, we say little w, little w for eye, or maybe let's go eyes, e, let's say little e, little e for round eyes. All right, so... There's two, there's four possible alleles, right? You can either have big E, little e, so you have a big E, or you have a little e, and you have a big R, and you have a little r. So there's four different alleles that you can have, and therefore, you can, each gamete can have two alleles. It can have, either have an E, or it can have an R. So it's gonna be inherited a little differently. So plant is heterozygous. Let's look at a plant example, and when we look at a plant example, I hope it's a little easier. It's really not much harder than the Punnett square. It's not much harder than a Punnett square. A plant is a plant that is heterozygous for being tall and having green seeds. It is crossed with a homozygous yellow and short. So if you have a plant that's heterozygous for being tall and having green seeds and it's crossed with a homozygous yellow and short. So let's talk about that. Let's say a plant has, let's say a plant has uh, green seeds and it's crossed, uh, having green seeds, tall green seeds. So it's tall. We don't know what the second gene is. And it's green. But we don't know what the second gene is here, right? But it says heterozygous, right, for both. So now we do know, all, 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 really quickly, we do know that this is small t and this is little g. So there's two traits. So it's four alleles, right? And 
it's only going to give one of each of these alleles, or, or it's only going to give two of these alleles, one of these two and one of these two, to its sperm or its egg, right? And the other one is homozygous yellow and green and short. So the other parent, this is crossed with another parent that's short and is yellow. So these are the alleles that this parent can give. Now you have to determine the gametes produced for each parent by using the FOIL method. And you know FOIL from math. So what you do is you say, well, first, there's four different possible gametes that, eat, that this heterozygous pair can make. And the first one, and I'll try to use different colors here, is that it could give a big T and a big G, right? So this can get here. A big T and a big G. The next possibility is that big T can go with a little g. That's big T and little g. And the next possibility to get little t and big G, get little t and big G. And the next, of course, last possibility is to get little t, little g. So those are your four possible gametes that, four different sperm that this particular plant can produce. Uh, the other plant can produce only one possible gamete, right? Can only give a little t and a little g. So the only gamete this gave is little t, little g. So what do we do? We take this, big T, big G. I mean, we have here, big T, little g. And we put little t, big G. And then little t, little g. All came from this FOIL method, right? That you learned in, in math. So you want to come across and you just use FOIL just to make sure you get all the possible variations. And really, there's only one possible gamete these guys can produce. So you don't have to do it all here. This is all irrelevant. Because really, we just want ratios and percentages. And all these will be the same. Here, this, this one will be the same as all the rest. Because all this parent has to give is... All this parent has to give is a little t, a little g. So this parent, this child here, this progeny is going to have big T, little t, big G, little g. This will be big T, little t, little g, little g. And this will be little t, little t, big G, little g. And this will be little t, little t, little g, little g. You'll say, what the heck? What does that all mean, right? Well, what that means is that this parent who was tall with green, right? Tall and green, but had four alleles because it had two recessive ones, was crossed with this thing was short and yellow, short and yellow. And when it made little sperm or little eggs or pollen, when it made its pollen, it, this thing had big T, so it gave a big T. She only had little t, so that's all she gave. So it's tall. This this child is going to be, this zygote would grow up to be a tall plant. And because there's a big G in here, this would be a green plant. But it's heterozygous for both, just like dad was. This one would be tall. It would certainly be a tall plant because it has the big T and little t it got from mom. And But it would be yellow. So this is tall and green. This is tall and yellow. Where this one is short and green, and this one's short and yellow. Because you see there's no big G here. And you see because there's no big T here. This is short and this is yellow. So interestingly, the phenotypic ratios would be uh, one quarter. The phenotypes would be one quarter uh, uh, tall and green. It would be one quarter tall and yellow. And it would be one quarter short and green. And it would be one quarter short and yellow. So of the four possibilities here, one quarter of them are short and green, one quarter is tall and yellow, one quarter tall and green, and one quarter short and yellow. Those are your phenotypic ratios. And of course, genotypic ratios uh, 
I'm not, I really would rather not write all this out, but your genotypic ratios, you have one big T, little T, uh, one heterozygote for both to one heterozygote, big T, little T, uh, and homozygote for the green, and another homozygote for tall and heterozygote for the color, and finally one homozygote for each. So you have one to one to one to one genotype ratio, genotypic ratios for each of these. Now you can see quickly that this could be really complicated if both of these uh, if both of these were heterozygotes because you'd have four different possibilities. Let's look at one. Okay, then let's make sure you understand all uh, review all these genetic ideas and go back and, and review and see if you can find the answers. So again, here's some more review questions for you to look at based on what you've done up to now. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about that uh, father having uh, big B, big B, right? And big E, little E. How do I know that? Father has black hair and he's homozygous and brown eyes or heterozygous. And mom has blonde hair, blue eyes. So she's little B, little B, little E, little E. And what are the possible uh, combinations that dad could give? He can give. Uh, big B, Big E, remember the FOIL method. If we use the FOIL method, you get Big B, Big E. So it's Big B, Big E. And another, come out one more time, that's Big B, Little E is another possibility. Uh, and really, if you look, if you think about it, since, he has, since he's homozygous for this, these are the only two possible gametes he can make because he can make two of these and two of these because big B, little big B, big E, and big B, little E again. Mom can only make a big B, a little B, little E. That's all she can give. So mom is uh, over here. Mom is little B, little B, little E, little E. And dad is big. Dad can only be. That could only be one of two possibilities. That can only be Big B, Big E, or Big B, Little E. And Mom can only give Little B, Little E. So Dad could give a Big B, Little E, or Big B, Big E. And big B, little E. Mom could give a big B, or rather little B, little E. So this, there's only two possible offspring this could give is big B, little B, and big E, little E, or big B, little B, and little E, little E. So the children, you know, what uh, the question, you can answer your question yourself. But you see, this is a dihybrid cross, but this is actually one of the simplest types of dihybrid crosses. Uh, the simplest being two homozygote recessives for both traits. But you can see that this is how you would work this problem out. So here you can figure this out. This is uh, bikini bottom genetics. No more practice for you. Uh, Punnett squares, percentages, uh, ratios should be kind of fun for you to, to work these out. And you should be able to work these out. It shouldn't be too much trouble for you. And this one, this first one up here is like the one we've done. We did uh, the first dihybrid cross you did where you had one heterozygote and one homozygote. But I'd like to work this one out with you if you don't mind because you have two heterozygotes uh, here. Both parents are heterozygous for both. So if you have black hair, uh, it doesn't, you know, let's see. Okay, yeah, yeah, black hair is big and, and eye color, brown eyes are just like we did before. So black hair, heterozygote. So big B, little B, and big E, little E. This is gonna be very important that we, that you understand this, that how complicated this can get. And so I really would like, it's not really that complicated, but I'd like to work this one out with you. So big B, little B, 
biggie literally because they're heterozygous both parents are heterozygous for both eye color and the hair so that's big b little b big e literally now that's important uh, because when we do the foil method and we see big b to big e right here so this can give a big b big e it can also give a big b with little e big b with little e it can give a small b with a big e with a big e and it could give a small b with little e as you take the last of it and of course mom could do the same thing so the <coughs> mom and dad have the same four possible outcomes so dad could give big b oh let me erase that dad could give big b big e dad could give big b little e dad could give little b big e and dad could give big little b little e and mom can give you the same possible outcomes. Now, this is probably the most complicated type of problem that anyone will give you. So this will be big B, big B, big E, big E. This is big B, big B, big E, little E. This is big B, little B, big E, little E, or big E, big E. And this is big B, little B, big E, little E. You see, I got those that I just took this big B here. I brought it down. This big B came over here. This big E came here. This big E came here. And I did this for all four coming across. And as I come across and do it, I'll have some of these repeating and some of these won't be repeating. But you can see that there's a lot of variation here. Uh, as far as which one we're going to get for each of these two traits and what combination of these are we going to get. And As we do this, as you see me do this, hopefully you would have done this on your own. You wouldn't have needed me to do this, but in case you did, here it is. And all I'm doing is bringing them down. So if you want to know how many of these are going to have blonde hair and blue eyes, says so little b, little b, little e, little e. There's only, let's think about it. How many of these do you see here are going to be blonde hair and blue eyed? Only one out of 16. Only one out of 16. Uh, so think about that. As you're thinking about how do you, when you have somebody who's heterozygous for everything, for both, how are you going to get, how many, what percentage are you going to get blonde and blue eyes? How, what percentage of these, of all these genotypes that someone who's heterozygous are you going to get with brown eyes and black hair? Uh, there's only going to be one of these guys as well. Homozygous for black and brown eyes, right? Because if you're talking about phenotypes, so here, here you're talking about phenotype, right? Blonde hair and blue eyes. So you only got one sixteenth. This is one sixteenth. Is going to be blonde hair and blue eyes because these are the recessive. This is a recessive trait, and there's only only one out of this 16 that's four by four, so you know there's 16 of them, right? Four by four grid. But if you start counting up phenotypes, how many different phenotypes might you have? Well, how many of these have black hair and brown eyes? This has black hair and brown eyes. 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 Same here, 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 uh, and here. All those have black hair and brown eyes. Why do I say that? Because all you need to have black hair is one big B. And all you need to have uh, brown eyes is one big E. So you see all of these have one big B and one big E because they're dominant. These are dominant phenotypes. And all of these have one either have at least one big B and one big E. It's just that simple. So... If your question is, 
how many of these are going to be, what percent or what ratio is going to be black hair with uh, brown eyes? Well, you're going to have, uh, out of 16, you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <coughs> you have 9 out of 16. Again, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 out of 16 are going to have black hair and brown eyes. How many of these then might you expect are going to have black hair with blue eyes? Here's black hair. And here's blue eyes, only two E's. Here's black hair and blue eyes. Here's black hair and blue eyes here. So you only have <coughs> three that have black hair and blue eyes. So what percent of your population might you expect, or ratio, whatever you want to say, are going to have black hair with blue eyes? And here you're going to have one, two, three out of 16 are going to have black hair with blue eyes. Only one out of 16 is blonde and blue eyed. And how many are going to have blonde hair with black, uh, brown eyes? How many are going to have blonde hair with brown eyes? It's going to be this is blonde, this is blonde, this is blonde with brown eyes, right? So it's again three out of 16. So, um, what percent is going to have black hair? Oops, that's not right. Blonde hair with blue eyes. Oop, brown eyes. And that's going to be three sixteenths. So nine sixteenths are going to be brown hair, black hair with brown eyes. Three sixteenths are going to be black with blue, and blonde with brown eyes is going to be three sixteenths. And only one sixteenth is going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. So you can calculate the percentages. Just divide nine by sixteen and multiply it times a hundred, and that'll give you your percentages. So now the question then is. What about genotypes? Wow, they can go crazy with genotypes. Couldn't they? It'd go crazy trying to figure out genotypes, but let's go ahead and do it. What the heck? It's on a video. We're doing it. Let's do it. What can be the genotypic ratios here? Well, homozygous dominant, you only got one of them. So that's one homozygous dominant. Uh, let's see. Homozygous dominant for hair color but heterozygotes for for uh for eye color there's only one here and one here as far as i can see i don't know if you see any anything else but with the homozygous and then the heterozygote eye color there's only two so one to two all right then when we're talking about homozygote uh, uh heterozygote for heterozygote for uh, hair color and homozygous dominant for eye color there's two there you go there's only really two that are, that are available there uh, so that's two one to two to two um, let me look at dominant homozygous dominant hair homozygous recessive uh, eye here again I only see one of these, one to two to two to one. So that's this one's gone, right? We already got this one. Here's heterozygous for both. That's one here. There's two. There's three. There's four. So there's four of those. One to two to two to one to four. And here, heterozygous. For hair color and homozygous for eye color, there's two. So there's two here. And homozygous recessive and homozygous dominant, for this time for eye color to one, right? It's only one of these. And homozygous for recessive or blonde hair, so blonde hair, right? 
But heterozygous for eye color, that's two of those. That's these two. And then finally, you have homozygous for both, that's one. So your ratio is not one to two to two to one to four to two to one to two to one. <laughs> that's crazy. But if you wanted to look at percentages, so if you, if somebody asks you for ratios, you see you can do this on a test. Is all you have to do is say, well, what kind of these are all genotypes here? Okay, so these are all genotypes. You saw all this did was take time, and counting. That's all I was doing, right? So I looked at the different possible genotypes or different combinations. Homozygote for hair color, homozygote dominant for eye color. There's only one of those. That's this one here, and homozygous dominant for hair color and a heterozygote for eye color. There's only two of those. That's what I put here. So I just go down and count and put the ratios and I'm done with that. And if I want to know, if somebody asks me percentages of ratio of, of genotype, I say, what is the percentage uh, homozygous dominant hair and eye color both? Well, then I would just say 1 out of 16, and I can do that. 1 divided by 16 times 100, that's my percentage of this, right? So I can do that with all the genotypes. The phenotypes are much easier, much more likely someone would ask you, especially in a longer test. Uh, anyone that would want you to actually try to pass would ask you more about phenotypes. And so what phenotypic ratio would you have? All you have to do is count up how many black hair color with blue eyes you have and that's anytime you see a big B that's black and anytime you see little lily that's blue and there's only one black with blue eyes that's black with blue eyes is here and there was another one here there's two ways to get black here right that's big B little B and big B big B so this is black and blue eye this is black and blue eye and this is black and blue eye so we have uh, three out of these 16 that can be black with blue eyes and then et cetera with all the rest of the of the phenotypes so this is why a dihybrid cross can be complicated the two things you need to remember is you do new, do the foil so you have to figure out how many get different kinds of gametes it can make you saw in one example that you had four possible for one parent and the other parent could only give you one that was the first dihybrid cross i showed you in the second dihybrid cross, you saw that each parent could only really give one, or I think one parent could give two and the other one one. That was easy as well. In this one, you saw that both parents could get, make these four possible combinations. So you had these four possible combinations. You know, uh, it could give, this parent could give, you could have a sperm that has uh, brown hair and, uh, and, and uh, dark eyes, uh, brown eyes, and you have, uh, brown hair and blue eyes and blonde and brown eyes and blonde and blue eyes. It could give you those three different, uh, four different alleles, but so could mom, because they're both heterozygous for both. Both mom and dad are brown eyed and black haired, but they could have a blonde, blue eyed baby. They have one in 16 chance of having a blonde, blue eyed baby. All right, so interesting the way this all works out it's probably the most interesting of all uh, of a, a lot of the science and probably the and definitely the most mathematical genetics is one of the more mathematical ones and it's all based on this kind of square crossing and multiplying and for and this foil method where you see you take the first and you multiply times the first and you take the second and you do the the second and then you take the second and multiply times the first and the second and multiply times the second and you get these Four possibilities. All right. So this should have been a homework set, but I'm giving you an opportunity to do this as a test and take-home test. You can work them out. Uh, it really is a, a matter of completion. You got to understand that this is just a matter of you trying to work these out. We're going to work them out in class. But here's two more sets of these dihybrid crosses. And here's some more dihybrid crosses, so you should be able to work these out. And three more sets here. And here's some more genetics working, uh, more practice, more dominant recessive stuff. And here's some more genetics review questions that should hopefully run it, finish off what you need to know.
And here's Mendelian genetics kind of overview with the concepts and vocabulary. So there shouldn't be any issues with Mendel's laws. Uh, <coughs> the concept of Punnett squares, the concept of the hybrid, uh, the hybrid crosses. And so hopefully you get all the vocabulary words and all the ideas ready to go. And here's some more. Here's some voc here the actual vocabulary that I've already given you all this. So hopefully all together this works out for you. And you understand what's going on.